Well, naval food. It's always a fun thing to think about, if not necessarily a fun thing to eat. But when I was asked to make this particular video, I thought, well, we could look at naval food through the ages, but to be perfectly honest, naval food in the 20th century, and to be honest, much of the 19th century, is not that exciting. The advent of steam power in ships meant that refrigeration was possible, canned goods were also possible, and various other kinds of uh, preservation technology, which means that whilst the naval food available on a World War I or World War II or ironclad warship might be somewhat at variance from what your typical diet is these days, it's not going to be an entirely foreign concept to most people. And so, rather than sort of give a brief history of all of that, I thought it would be better to look at a period of naval history for which food is actually fairly well documented, but also quite different from what you and I might eat today. And that, of course, is the 18th century, the classic age of sail. And so we're going to focus on Royal Navy food. There would, of course, be differences in other navies, depending on what they had to hand in terms of their supplies. And, of course, the officers would generally eat much better than the men. But since the Royal Navy was the largest navy, roughly speaking, of this period, and obviously the rank and file were the ones who were eating the majority of the food, it's fair to say that the single largest type of diet at sea in the 18th century was that of the common Royal Navy sailor. So that's the one we'll be looking at. If people would like me later on to look at perhaps what the diet of a French sailor or a Spanish sailor, etc. would be like and how that varied from the British diet, then I'm quite happy to do that if you let me know in the comments below. Thanks to extensive Admiralty documentation, what exactly was the diet of Royal Navy sailors during this period is pretty well documented down to even when the food was rationed on a weekly basis. Common to pretty much any ship throughout the century was the biscuit or hardtack. Butter, cheese, oatmeal and peas were also pretty much a staple and you might be recognising a theme in that all of these things are very easy to preserve and keep over long periods of time with minimal amounts of intervention from things like refrigeration which whilst it was in partial use on land was not at use at sea because the mechanical refrigerator had not yet been invented and these things had to keep for a long time weevils aside of course Experiments with other foodstuffs were tried, but they tended to degenerate into massive numbers of insects or a lot of mould. Drink was a slightly different matter. At the start of the 18th century, simple beer was the general issue. But during the 1700s, i.e. the 18th century, grog, a watered-down form of rum, became standard issue across the Navy. And that's what we'll be considering. Later on, of course, experiments trying to get rid of scurvy would result in the introduction of lemon juice and the increased levels of British control over sugar production, mostly in the West Indies, would result in sugar also becoming part, albeit a smaller part, of a Royal Navy seaman's diet. The meat issue, however, was um, rather interesting. Early on, fish was occasionally used, and indeed, uh, sailors would take pretty much whatever fresh meat they could get their hands on at uh, any given time, whether that be fish, local animals they could trade for, etc. But the rations that they were given would generally either be salted beef, salted pork, or a mixture of the two. Now, contrary to some popular historical myths, this was not a diet of deprivation. Granted, you could have instances where perhaps the victuallers, i.e. the people who supplied the food, had, shall we say, cut things a little bit short to line their own pockets, so you could get cases of rotten meat, or extremely hard hardtack, or perhaps not hardtack that hadn't been baked enough, and this is where the weevils came in. 
if the meat was particularly poorly preserved obviously it might rot if it was fanatically over preserved it might be almost rock hard but these things when they were caught were generally punished by the admiralty and towards the end of the 18th century which is the period from which we're going to be taking our diet there was actually a fairly stringent set of measures in place to control the quality and quantity of food being issued to the Royal Navy. It was also quite a high energy diet. The full diet for a Royal Navy sailor of any given warship would add up to about 5,000 calories. Now you might think, well hang on a minute, that's almost double what most people today are advised to eat. Well yes, this is true, but then most people these days aren't spending pretty much every waking hour hauling guns weighing multiple tons around, running up and down yard arms, rigging, cleaning the decks, and doing all other sorts of physical work. And you generally tend to find that those kinds of people who are involved in hard physical activity for considerable periods of time, even in the modern day, such as builders, will often have a diet that is more towards that end of things than the typical normal advised diet. As well as that, Modern clothing has a lot to do with the reduction in calorie intake because sailors of the period, they didn't have tremendous amounts of clothes available to them unless they'd been specially equipped for going into particularly hazardous areas like the Arctic. And that would mean that on a typical day, you'd be burning off a fair bit of energy just staying warm, especially obviously once sea spray and such got involved. Whereas even the hardest working person in the first world today can at least have a guarantee that if it is absolutely freezing, they've probably got a coat or something to wear until their natural exertions build up enough body heat that they might not need it. Now, of course, fresh meat, vegetables, bread, rice, fresh fruit, etc. would also be part of the diet if they were close enough to port to get their hands on them, or perhaps if they were far enough away from port that they had to be substituted, since, for example, a ship cruising off the Indian coast would find plentiful rice in most ports, but not a tremendous amount of oatmeal. As other foods became available due to worldwide exploration and colonialization, these also would begin to see introduction in different navies at different times and to varying degrees, so potatoes, for example, becoming quite widespread at some point towards the latter part of the century, and to be honest, more so into the 19th. But of course, one of the attractions of this particular video, hopefully at least, is the fact that it's a very different diet to most people's these days. With that being said, this also means that you can't just go out and buy half the stuff that's involved here, especially stuff like hardtack and naval grade salted beef. So we're going to have to make some of these things. And thus, at the beginning of the month, it was time to start preparing the beef. Since, of course, this would take a considerable amount of time to actually prepare. Okay, so welcome to the mess deck of HMS Drac. So we're going to be looking at some of the staples of the 18th century sailor's diet. Hardtack will be one of them, obviously, because uh, what else was there going to be? Uh, a couple of other interesting bits, but the thing that's going to take us the longest to prepare is actually the beef or pork. You can do salt beef or salt pork. They're the two main staples, but I have beef and I prefer beef, so we're doing beef. Uh, so we have our beef joint. Now, interestingly enough, this is all from a book called Feeding Nelson's Navy. And this actually points out that Stuff like offal and skin and bones were actually, according to the Admiralty rules at least, forbidden from being included. So we're going to switch it over to pounds here to work out how much beef we actually have. So five pounds, four ounces. So we're going to have to cut a little bit off of this thing. So that's not a terrible tragedy because that means that, hey, I have more beef that won't be salted because knowing me and my cooking skills, this could go horribly wrong. Right, so let's prepare ourselves some beef. I'm gonna go and get this packaging off. Hmm. 
There we go, a beef. Now we are going to have to make a few changes to this because as you might recognize this is actually a roasting joint because that's what they had in the supermarket in this weight class. So that netting, which is very not 18th century, is going to have to come off. Just using the tissue here to try and absorb some of the uh, moisture already because that is ultimately what we are going to be doing by salting it and this thing has as you might guess been in a freezer so there's a lot of condensation right beef now previously this was weighing in at about five and a half pounds so i mean it is lessening so it's like one two three four uh one Four and a bit, so minus a bit for that. So if we take off this much, this is right there saving the end for later purposes. I don't know what you mean, I'm off to eat it right now in a cupboard, raw in the dark. <laughs> Come on. Okay, well we're going to have to wash this scale out anyway, so let's see how much beef we've got left. Four pounds, two ounces. That's not a bad bit of estimation on my part, I'd say. Um, well, we're going to leave that extra two ounces of beef on there because I really can't be bothered to <laughs> cut more of it off. Um, now, this is obviously a roasting joint in that time they would have cut it in fairly large slabs so because getting access to the liquid or the moisture at the middle of this joint is going to be rather difficult in this case for our um, salting and drying process i am going to see if i can cut this into two or three sections two or three nice slabs rather than one big one uh, mrs drack can you secure that please otherwise it's going to get away from me I think that's probably good enough, mm -hmm. at least for the salt purposes. Right, so with that all done, it's now time to go for the salting process. Now, according to the instructions that are provided in the book, this salting process would take about a week, it's a six days, and it involves putting the salt into a barrel, then putting the beef on the salt, then putting more salt over the beef, and then putting more beef over the salt, and so on and so forth, until the barrel is full. And then you drain off the brine and re-salt twice a day for six days. So I suspect, lovely as this wonderful looking joint is, it's probably not going to be this big by the time we finished with it. Nevertheless, unfortunately, while I do have a barrel, it's my mead barrel, and I'm not cutting the top off my mead barrel just to do some salt beef. So we're going to use the slow cooker um, bowl instead. And we're going to use a lot of cooking salt. Um, now again, according to the original instructions, this would have been done using a thing called saltpeter and salt, a mixture of the two, um, which According, again, according to the period sources, this was not, strictly speaking, the saltpeter, now the air tastes of salt. Yeah. This is not, strictly speaking, the saltpeter that you'd find as another term for uh, some rather interesting components that make up gunpowder, but actually it seems to be what we would call rock salt. But I'm not going to go raiding council bins for rock salt. <laughs> so we're just going to use salt. Um, okay, we we'll probably lose some of the earthy flavours, but come on, we're making Navy issue salted beef. Do we really think flavour is a massive concern? So, one bit of beef. 
and a lot of salt. Don't worry, I've got more. And another, it almost is heartbreaking to do this to good beef, but you see the sacrifices I make for you? Oh, and that air really tastes of salt. <laughs> Arcane symbology has now been drawn in the salt. <laughs> so I think that protects us from minions? Mine! <laughs> there. Oh yes, it's a mine. Okay. Oh, now, seriously, the air tastes of salt. It's disgusting. It's delicious. Um, so, that's our four pounds of beef in a fairly considerable amount of salt. And I need better camera work for this kind of thing. Now, that is part of day one. Well, it is day one. So now we are going to have to leave this and draw, as I say, draw off the brine, resalt twice a day for the next six days. Okay, welcome to our list of ingredients for breakfast on an 18th century naval warship. These are the things you need for burgoo. The spoon is obvious, you need that for mixing. But burgoo is a very simple recipe. It's two parts water, two cups of water, to one cup of oatmeal, and apparently that's enough for four people. We'll see how that goes. There's our cup measure. And, well, we need a bowl to eat it in. Um, and apparently you can taste it, season it to taste with butter and salt. It also says sugar and cream, but I think butter and salt are probably more likely to be found on a ship on a long-term voyage, unless you're, of course, the officers. So that's our basic ingredients, and let's begin the cooking process. So here's our pot sitting stylishly on the cooker, and according to the recipe, we need to put in the two cups of water first. Thank you very much, glamorous assistant. And I am immediately terrible at pouring water, it turns out. Well, that's one cup of water, two cups of water, and a distinctly non-18th century cloth to absorb some of the water I managed to spill into the stove, because I am a moron. Well, that's most of it anyway. It's not going to interfere with the rest of the process. So. We have our two cups of water, and now we need our cup measure of oats. Turns out I'm just as bad at pouring oats on camera as I am pouring water. So I'm going to do it off camera where I can actually use both hands to control the flow of oats, which is not a sentence I ever thought I'd have to say. So there's our cup of oats, plus uh, a few random strays that got into the water. And now I'm going to need an equally non-18th century paper towel to try and get some of those oats out of the way before they start soaking in. We'll clear up the rest later. Right, well. It then says to bring slowly to a boil. So, with the miracle of the gas cooker, we shall do this. Well, as you can see, the mixture is beginning to do something. Of course, all of this would have been done traditionally in a ship's galley with very large amounts of this stuff 
but we have neither a ship's galley nor a massive cauldron, nor do I particularly fancy making an entire cauldron's worth of oats, so I'm going with the just two, two cups to one cup, which as I said is apparently enough for four people. Um, I mean, given the size of this pot, this is what I would normally classify as my portion of porridge. <laughs> Or oats, I guess. So, um, I guess we'll see how much this all swells up to once it's all done and dusted. Leaving that in there. Well, it's got to a texture where I could probably put up wallpaper with it, if nothing else. On the advice of Mrs. Drack, who apparently is an expert in these things, we've moved it over to the low temperature burner to let it simmer for a bit. Well, whilst we're doing that, we're going to introduce you to the other element of, <laughs> potentially at least, 18th century naval breakfasts, and that is called Scotch coffee. So, here's the first ingredient in Scotch coffee. No, we're not eating a toaster. That's for the Adeptus Mechanicus. We are, in fact, burning bread, intentionally. So, bread up to... What well, toaster up to six. And why are we doing this? Well, apparently the main ingredient for Scotch coffee, other than boiled water, is burnt bread. So we'll come back to the burnt bread a little bit later. And so it is ready. Okay, so here's our first dish of the um, day. I've got to say that is a truly unimpressive amount of of uh, burgoo. I mean, dividing it up into, I mean, you pretty much can divide it up into four, but really? Um, okay, I guess that's why the Scotch coffee's there as well. Um, let's have a taste. I mean, I've tasted things that are plainer. Sandwich bags sand. Um, I can see why they might use this stuff. So this is, um, we're doing a butter day. So they didn't have exactly the same rations every day. Some days they'd have peas, other days they'd have butter and so on and so forth, and cheese. Since I hate all, almost all vegetables with the exception of potatoes, which are an honorary meat, of course, with the power of a thousand burning suns, I am not going to eat peas. So I very conveniently decided that we are having a non-peas day, um, which was a thing. Um, you get two ounces of butter. This is about half an ounce per day to go through your food. I'm going to use this half ounce of butter in this because I'm not eating another bite of this thing until <laughs> there's more flavour in it. And then I'll see if I need some salt. I mean, this is fairly good butter, but melting well at least. Let's have a bit of a push around. And I mean, presumably, if you're only getting a quarter of this, you might not use quite as much butter. But let's say I'm being generous because I have some pity for the other three men who are going to be eating this stuff, and I don't want them to hate me either. So I'm sharing some of my precious butter in an attempt to make this part way to edible. The good news is it's still so hot enough off the stove that the butter's almost completely melted in. Yeah, I think that's about as melted in as we're going to get with this butter. So, has that improved the taste of this wallpaper paste? I mean, kind of. I don't hate it. It now tastes like wallpaper paste that you've smeared molten butter on. So that brings us to the other ingredient, salt. So they had salt, it would be part of their rations as well, so let's add a bit, apparently, apparently let's add half of what, <laughs> the salt that I'd rationed out. Um, and see what that does.
you know it's weird but actually adding that amount of salt has made it halfway to acceptable that's actually not bad it's very strange it's not the kind of porridge that or oats that I would normally have but then again I smother mine in sugar and honey so that's not exactly a massive surprise but it definitely is edible certainly a massive improvement on the yatta dreck that it was at the beginning um, let's try a little bit more I could get used to this. Not a bad breakfast, if I do say so myself. But before we go on with eating that, let's see how our Scotch coffee is coming along. So, here's our basic ingredients for Scotch coffee. We have burned our bread, and um, well, I, it says burned bread, so I'm presuming they need to vulcanize it. Well, apparently these, this, is, this is the ingredients for Scotch coffee, so um, let's take our mug and I don't know exactly how much to add because it doesn't actually say, but we'll start off with if I was making coffee, how much would I add? How many much coffee grounds? Well, we'll go with most of it, and of course I've made a complete mess, as usual. But, we'll tidy that up later. Let's go and get some boiled water I made earlier. I mean, it looks like coffee. And waste not, want not. Now, off to find some sugar because I think I'm going to want some. So, here is our burnt bread scotch coffee. I must admit I am not especially ecstatic at trying to drink this, especially since I don't particularly like tea or coffee anyway. I know I'm British and that may be heresy, but I'd rather be able to start my mornings without caffeine. I don't think there's any caffeine in this, so even if I somehow magically get addicted to it, I am not really at risk of that, but... That is utterly vile! <laughs> it tastes like liquid burnt bread. Shockingly. Um, I suppose if you ground up a pencil and drank that, you might get a similar effect, if you'd set the pencil on fire. Um, luckily... For everyone concerned, it does say in the um, in the book that you can add sugar, and I can guarantee you only someone with no taste buds whatsoever wouldn't. So I have my sugar. Let's add a bit first. I'm still using the knife because yeah, why not? Now it's fractionally less vile in that it doesn't want me want it doesn't make me want to rip my own tongue out. Okay, that's approaching acceptable. There's still a nasty burnt aftertaste, but there's enough sugar in there that I'm not quite getting most of it, but still. 
So that's about half a ramekin of sugar. I don't know what ramekin measures are, but whatever they are, that's half half of one in sugar. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, the sugar has in fact stopped dissolving. So we have now reached the saturation point of this solution, um, for those of you who are keeping up with the chemistry of this all. Now, bizarrely enough, it actually does taste like coffee with sugar, except coffee with milk in it with sugar. So I have no idea how vulcanized bread relates to coffee grounds and milk, but apparently if you add enough sugar to it, it tastes roughly the same. That said, as I said, we have reached the saturation point of this stuff, so I may just be drinking carbon-flavored caramel, which doesn't sound too bad. Yeah, I could drink this. I have a feeling that I'd probably run the ship out of sugar in a couple of weeks, so I probably wouldn't be allowed to drink this. <laughs> um, so I have a feeling that in real life, if I was on a Napoleonic era warship, I would probably be trading my Scotch coffee for literally anything else, including the Burgoo. In fact, I think I would probably rather eat the Burgoo without the salt and butter before I drank this stuff without enough sugar. That said, it's weirdly pleasant once you put enough sugar in it. Which is not a result I expected, I must admit. <sighs> Scotch coffee, the drink of system. And here's what we need for ship's biscuit. One pound of flour and three quarters of a pint of water. Now the recipe says that you should add the flour to a bowl and not the mixing bowl because the mixing bowl is too fragile and then slowly add the water and mix it till it has a silky smooth texture. Um, the standing mixer does not seem to have dough hooks but it has these very strong Beaters, so hoping that's going to work out. Um, and well, well, we'll go with that. Obviously they didn't have electric beaters back then, but the alternative is to spend 30 minutes kneading dough, and frankly I have better things to do with my time. So, in goes our one pound of flour. Down goes our beaters. In goes a first amount of water. And would help if I switched the power on. And now we leave it to sit for approximately 10 minutes before putting it out on the board. Okay, it is now time to decant the dough somehow. And, oh, <coughs> plow your hands, Drac, plow your hands. Morgan Freeman voice. He did not, in fact, flower his hands. Because he was a moron. Right, now, with flowered hands, we suddenly become very needy. And we're supposed to roll this out to about three quarters of an inch thickness. Okay, and then we cut it into sections. Now apparently these are supposed to go into squares, but of course I can't roll for toffee, therefore it's not actually in squares, so we're going to do it in three inches, about that. So. 
So we ended up needing two trays and apparently we're supposed to poke the holes in it, so we'll find out. I mean, it's not exactly like they would have had 100% accuracy every single time anyway. So this was the end result of the first set of baking. Um, it looks slightly weird and odd and everything, but it's okay. And that, to be honest, is part of the problem. It's okay. It's tough. It's somewhat breakable, but as you can see, it didn't bake all the way through um, in the time spent in the oven, and I can, <laughs> I can still kind of eat it. Um, it's a bit disappointing. First time is edible is a disappointing result for cooking, but we have solved this problem because as you probably realise that that mixture was probably far too wet. So mixing by hand, I've made up a new batch. Um, this is half the size of the other batch, I used half a pound of flour, but instead of going by a strict uh, ratio according to the recipe book, I just added flour, oh, sorry, I put the flour in, added water until it just about held together as a dough. And as soon as it held together as a dough, mix, knead, press, roll, stab, and now biscuits. And so these will go in the oven on 160 for several hours and then cool down and then turn them over and bake them in the oven at 160 for another few hours tomorrow and we shall have at last biscuit that we can use to make both our dinner or supper as the case may be depending on how you term it and our lunch because the lunch result needs powdered biscuit so let's see how this all goes okay so for crushing the ship's biscuit it recommends wrapping it in a cloth one so you don't lose fragments of ship's biscuit and two so that when those fragments go flying, you don't end up with razor sharp bits of ship's biscuit flying everywhere. So, there's our bits of ship's biscuit in our cloth. We're wrapping it up in the cloth and we're putting the cloth on the board just in case we completely end up annihilating the board. That's sacrificial. I don't want to really sacrifice the entire work surface. And then we have this. My, uh, one of my medieval reenactment tools so we are now going to hit it repeatedly they apparently would have used an axe boarding axe or something i mean this is kind of an axe so okay let's check the uh, contents getting there but no cigar yet There you go folks, how to use a large medieval semi-pole weapon as a tool for cooking. That's probably enough. So let's move on to the onion. Okay, so here's our obviously 20th century pan heated with oil. And so the frying commences. And so this is what we're going to call done on the onions. Um, they're going to go off to a plate because we're going to need this later. Um, going to keep most of the oil on there because, you know, we're going to be coming back to it and waste not, want not. Right, well, after a week of sitting in regularly changed salt and drawing off the brine, this is we've managed to turn our beef into. This is four pounds of salt beef, fairly solid, and of course four pounds of beef is supposed to be your ration for six out of your seven days. I got fish on one other day, so 
that means you're basically looking at about one third of each of these pieces for a given day's food. So let's say that. And this is a sharp knife. Um, Cleaver will go through the table as well. Mm. That looks delicious. Right. So, that's the profile of... Oops, sorry. There's the profile of our salt beef after seven days of curing. Um, looks a little bit red and still red in the middle, but pretty much fine I think. So this is going to be our this is going to be our piece of beef for today. I will probably cut that into a few smaller segments to ease the boiling process. Now yeah, going with the grain. I think. Maybe I'm just getting better at this. Right. There are our lumps. Now, the instructions for making this dish, which is our lunchtime dish, is which is called lobscouse, involves beef and then onions plus ship's biscuit. Um, which is supposed to be crushed up. This is uh, obviously the remnants of actually supper. Um, so the ship's biscuit, some of it has to be crushed up and put in as well, uh, plus some pepper. Later on they would also add things like potatoes and such like, but we're going to go with a fairly basic one which involves boiling up the beef and the crushed ship's biscuit until the beef gets somewhat you know, not to leather like, and the ship's biscuit becomes somewhat not geological. Um, <laughs> and once that's done, you then mix, you then fry it apparently with the pre fried onions and some pepper, which is relatively common spice by this point. Okay, so for the boiling process, I'm going to cheat slightly and pre, pre boiled the water. That's mainly so you don't have to sit here literally watching a pot boil. Here goes the salt pea. And... Here is our crushed biscuit. Okay, burner to max. And let the boiling process commence. We've got quite the healthy boiling going. Mm -hmm. But that biscuit is still solid, and I'm pretty sure it's supposed to not go be that way and that is still a very solid bit of beef so with a little bit of a stir on goes the boiling process okay so this is probably boiled to an acceptable degree so the next step According to the instructions, unfortunately they do not build us a spaceship, 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 but they do allow us to drain off the solution. So that's our lobscouse base, apparently. And then... Heat up the frying pan. And then it will, once the frying pan is vaguely hot, it will be time to add the lobscouse and the onions, fry it all together with a bit of pepper, and get
game on. Okay, the frying pan is hot enough. Mixy de mixy, stirry de stirry. And continue the frying of the frying. Check back later. And now, time to plate up. If such a thing can be said for this kind of stuff. Lobscouse, ladies and gentlemen. Well, here's our lobscouse. I also have a strip of the salt beef before it got boiled <laughs> as a comparison. So, uh, I've got a bit there are more appetizing sites, but let's try a bit of boiled salt beef. You know what, that's actually really nice. It's time in the vat has aged it. It's obviously very salty, so if you don't like salt, well, you're fresh out of luck with the Royal Navy, but it's actually really nice. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if it's rotten or it's gone overly hard, or your victualler has supplied you with really cheap beef. Really cheap. I mean, this isn't exactly the world's most expensive beef, but it's not like diced beef quality either. Then potentially it's going to be different. But if you like salt flavours and you like beef, I think I'm actually going to incorporate this into my normal diet as well. Actually, um, I'm not so sure about this stuff. Let's see how this goes. I mean, there's still that slightly underlying caramelised bread texture or taste to it. But a mixture of the frying, the oil and the pepper and the onion. I mean, it wouldn't be my first choice. But I could eat it. Certainly. Hmm, a little bit more of that burnt flavour coming through on that one. Uh, let's find another bit of beef. And... Get some of the... Uh, biscuit on it as well. Hmm. Okay, so the, the biscuit takes a little bit of the edge off the saltiness of the beef, which is probably a good thing overall, to be honest. And the saltiness of the beef flavour takes a fair bit off the edge of the caramelisation of the biscuit, which is also a good thing. That actually works really well together. I'm, I mean, I, I did think going into this that this will probably be of the three meals the nicest but i'm pleasantly surprised by the fact that i actually genuinely like this not just could tolerate but not necessarily sure i'd go through the effort and the expense of 
making this day to day because making those biscuits takes a long time with all the double baking and everything. But yeah. Mm. It does take a fair effort to chew through the beef though. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for comparison's sake. It will give in. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Um, full disclosure, I did have a little bit of this beforehand just to see if it even was edible pre-boiling. Um, and it was, it was quite nice. But, it's kind of a soft built tongue. Soft jerky. Um, hard jerky, soft built on. Hard jerky, soft built on, apparently, for Mrs. Drat. But, to be perfectly honest, as nice as this is, it's actually really much, much better boiled and whoop, boiled and served with um, table mats. <laughs> mashed biscuit. So. I genuinely didn't think I was going to be enjoying it this much. But it's a pleasant surprise. So that's dinner or lunch to know. That's lunch. Um, a runaway success, I would say. So we are now on the evening meal. Now, when you get issued your cheese and butter ration, again, according to the records, that's issued every other day. So you'd get four ounces of cheese, two ounces of butter. Well, we've already used half an ounce of our butter in our burgoo in the morning, so we can only afford an, another half ounce of butter here in the evening. That's, that's one of our two ounces used up each day. Additionally, Obviously, if you get four ounces of cheese once every two days, that means you get two ounces of cheese. So here's our two ounces of cheese. You also get one pound of biscuit, and uh, here's half a pound of biscuit. Um, I must admit that is looking somewhat threatening as a, as a, as a, di as a uh, afternoon dash evening meal. But the other half pound, as you will have seen, is used somewhat in both the uh, lunchtime or uh, menu and also in presumably either snacking throughout the day if you happen to have teeth made of diamond or possibly as melee weapons or ways to absorb enemy fire. Anyway, the other thing that's quite fun is that you would have some of your grog ration. So you'd have a, um, a pint of grog issued twice a day and that's because the grog itself is made up of a quart of water, so for those of you who work in course you'll know that's about two pints, and half a pint of rum, all mixed together. Plus a couple of additions which we're about to come to. Now, of course, your two issues of one pint of grog are supposed to last you for the entire day, so even though you get your evening ration and it's a, a full pint, I don't think that you're probably going to drink that all at your meal sitting. You might want you know something to drink elsewhere so we're going to make ourselves some grog and we're going to make it at around about half the total amount that would have been rationed out at the time um, so basically you get your pint ration and we're making half of that for our, our dinner so we've got is obviously 
in, uh, half a pint of water. And since the, the entire grog ration is made up using uh, one half pint of rum, that means we now need one eighth a pint of rum or 2.5 fluid ounces. So of course I went and got some navy rum. So there's our one quarter of our total rum. And we'll put that to one side. And by the time of the Napoleonic War era Navy, particularly the kind of Battle of Trafalgar campaign era, they're also issuing lemon juice. And in some of the earlier experiments, back in the earlier part of the 18th century, from the books and records I could find, they issued two thirds of a fluid ounce of um, lemon juice plus two ounces of sugar to the men with their grog ration. So unless I've made some horrible miscalculation, we then have to divide that through as well by four. So that equates to about one teaspoon um, of lemon juice and about a quarter of this sugar because this is two ounces of sugar so that'll be for the whole thing but before we do that I'm just gonna test the grog I mean it's not awful I hate water there's just enough of the rum in there to uh, make it drinkable for me but There's our lemon juice. So we don't get scurvy. And our sugar. Probably about a quarter of the sugar ramekin. So there is our scurvy preventing rum. And once again, to my eternal joy, the sugar has stopped dissolving. So let's see how this works. That's got an interesting taste to it. Still a little bit too much water for my liking, but perfectly drinkable. Now we have <laughs> If this is the reward for a hard day's labour, I'm beginning to understand the idea of mutinies. <laughs> this stuff is obviously the, the revised ship's biscuit we made. It's been baked for something approximating six to eight hours um, in two bit batches. I've yet to summon up the courage to try and eat it. Oh, but it does disintegrate. At least this version does. So that's boding well for my teeth. Little caramelized. Okay. Maybe there was a natural fault line. Because, um. Ow! Is that true? <laughs> or is that the. <laughs> that was the hard tack, actually. Just giving way. <laughs> I mean, like, kind of like dwarf bread, I guess. Do I want to sully the um, vaguely acceptable um, grog with uh, some hardtack? Well, I guess that some, you're going to have to find some way of making this a bit more edible.
I'd compare it to eating glass, if I've ever been dumb enough to eat glass, which I haven't. I'd imagine it's what eating glass is like. Mm, no, I'm sticking. Hmm. Okay. I mean, there's nothing objectionable to the taste, and there is that much of it, but... Um... Let's see if butter improves its prospects. I'm getting better at this. Ow! Okay. A little bit of butter does go a long way, to be fair. Um, let's see how a little bit of butter and a little bit of cheese does. <laughs> Very crude miniature open sandwich. Um, oh, I guess it's baked with flour, so technically it's a form of bread. Oh my goodness. You know, with a good mature cheddar and butter, once you've summoned up the molar strength to crush it like an industrial pile driver, I've got to say it's not actually terrible. It was extra mature cheddar, so there is a bit of a bite to the cheddar, so that's actually quite nice. I can't believe I'm doing this, but let's try another fragment. You know, if nothing else, this would give sailors incredibly powerful jaw muscles. The taste of that rock actually grows on you. Then again, I think the taste of anything will grow on you if it follows up hard tack. Um, Okay, well, you can also see why there are a lot of sea shanties sung and tales spun at the evening meals. Because this is not something you're eating in a hurry. Oh boy. Um, the things I go through for you. Okay, well, I'm going to see if I can finish off this this biscuit and then count myself lucky I'm not actually in the 18th century Royal Navy as an officer. So, hi. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was about an hour's experimental archaeology, I guess, in uh, figuring out how edible-tasty the 18th century sailor's diet was circa end of the 1700s, start of the 1800s. Basically, yeah. Breakfast can work, shockingly enough. Um, dinner is actually really nice, lunchtime. Um, and supper, maybe not so much. Probably dependent on the quality of the hardtack you get. Anyway, that is <laughs> this month's uh, top 
Patreon requested video. So if you liked it, let us know in the comments below. Um, obviously, it's a little bit of a departure from the way we normally, normally do videos. So regular service will recommence next week. Thanks very much for watching. See you again in another video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.